Front Royal Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're here. Um, I just have a handful of announcements to make. The first of which is that my announcement sheet's missing. There it is. On Thursday at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a worship team planning meeting. We're going to just kind of do a work session on why we worship, how we worship, what we're doing in worship. So if you have any thoughts, concerns, things you want to bring up, you can certainly talk to Ruth or myself or anybody on that committee. We'll be talking about the 1030 time slot and the changes that have happened here in um, after COVID. So just put your thinking hats on and let us know so that we can have all the voices at the table. Having said that, we need liturgists. and. Rumor has it, everybody knows how to read and everybody knows how to talk. So that means you are all qualified to serve as liturgists. Congratulations. And we always say God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So he will give you the words to say, the courage and the strength to do so. If you would like to serve as liturgist, now that you've all been told, just speak to me, Ruth or David. How's that, Ruth? Good. Um, and our kids are going back to school this week, next week, but our teachers go back this week. So next week, we're going to have a prayer for our kids, but this week, we're going to have a prayer for our teachers. So let's bow our heads. Lord, you have called us to different vocations, to different places in this world, and today we lift up teachers and educators. We lift up guidance counselors and custodians, principals and administration, all of those that care for the generation that we are raising to be the leaders of this world. We ask you, Lord, to give our teachers courage to speak up in the face of, of difficulties. We ask you to provide them with the tools that they need so that they might be for the students not only teacher but also a mentor. May you, Lord, fill all of our schools as our teachers are getting ready with your grace and your spirit and your truth. Even though we try to lock you out, Lord, we know that you are in and above and around all things. Through your son's name, amen. Zach is homesick today. Cecilia sent me a picture of her beautiful little braids, so if you'd like to see it, I'm happy to share it with you. So as we have our prayer for world peace, we are on seven tolls today. I will ring the bell. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. You created us in your image to love one another, and we have failed to do so not only here in our own corner of the world, but all around the world. And in that, Lord, we have taken up weapons, we have taken up bombs, we have taken up angry words, and greed has taught us that we get to take what we want. Individually, Lord, we pray for our own peace. For our nation, we ask you to heal the division that is among us so that we might speak with one voice. For Ukraine and Russia, for refugee camps and places that have not known peace in their lifetime, send your spirit through your son's name, amen. to worship. Sometimes God gets angry. People and nations do not do what they should. Today God reminds us of our covenant, asking us to wash and make ourselves clean, learn to do good, seek justice, 
Remind us, O oh God, and show us the right way to go. Our hymn is number 361, How Firm a Foundation. Please stand. Join me in the confession of sin. O oh God, your call for justice is so clear that we are amazed at how easily we fail to hear you over the din of daily life. We want to cease to do evil. We want to learn to do good. Yet we rarely do all we can to rescue defend and plead for those in need as you have sought us out we seek your pardon grant us courage we pray as persons as communities and as nations to bring about the justice you desire amen you're now the call of the assurance of pardon my friends we are acclaimed as children of God, each one of us made in God's own image. How can we not live a life of generosity after receiving such grace? So it is that God claims you, knows you, and he's got you. 
And in these waters of baptism, we remember that we are loved in order to love one another. My friends, know that you are forgiven. Go out and forgive others and be at peace. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's sermon right over here. Ah, I oh, you missed it last week, Leo, when we talked about PlayStations. I know, Helen. I know. I know. I thought you guys would be here, but now you want vacation. Did you ever do one? Good. But I have something with me today, and I'm just young, and then we'll just have to hear all my needs crack for you. Oh, I know, I'm old. Huh? Wait, so, do you know what this is? Oh, no. It's a notebook. Do you guys ever make to-do lists? You do? Yeah. 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 Somebody was hungry. So I want you to make a list today. Can you do that for me? 
uh, but if God wants you to do things tomorrow, come up with three things and write it on paper, and then tomorrow, at the end of the day, see what I have to do when I finish something on my list. See, I get to check it off. You get to check it, and that's the best feeling ever. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus and helping us not be afraid. Give us strength, give us strength to do the things you want us to do. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I think Miss Ava is going to do some painting of vintage, so be careful with your clothes, but we're going to finish up this vintage and put it outside. So you can go in the back with Miss Ava for children's worship, or you can go back and sit with your parents. My friends here at, at, at Front Royal, we give generously to the community in which we live. We give generously through food and housing and, and um, gifts of service and love. And all of that happens because we are able to combine our gifts. It does not matter if it's five cents or fifty dollars. And when it's put in God's hands, it is enough. So at this time, I'll invite you during the offertory to come bring your ties to the front. Let us worship God. and our church and we ask you lord to encourage us and use what we have to offer bless it use it to your kingdom in your use through your son's name amen please be seated
Our first scripture lesson today comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, and then 8 through 16. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abraham when he called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he was good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Donna. We'll have our pastoral prayer and uh, Lord's Prayer at the communion table, but I will bring up that um, in our prayers today, we keep David, he was in the hospital, the ER, double vision, he's home, he tells you, he says, uh, he says hi to everybody, and so we'll just, Donna, no doubt, has him taken care of. Also, yesterday, Tracy Ramey went to the emergency room, and she is home recovering as well. Um, we continue to keep Althea and Ron in our prayers, um, and Deanne has, we are continue to keep her in our prayers and what is possibly her final days with her family. We pray for travelers and teachers and students. Any others that you would like for me to lift up when we have our prayer? Jake. Marsha, absolutely. Anybody else? Go ahead, Sherry. Good. Clayton's surgery was a success, and I like praises. We did that last week, and we need to say it more often. Marta. Wow. Your niece? Wow. That. I praise God. That's, what, that's all you can say. Absolutely. That is a definite play of praise. Anybody else? Anne. Did I see something over here? Ruth. Khaleesi will be nine. I know. Happy birthday, Khaleesi. Anybody else? I think God cares about silly things, too. And in Scripture, it says a lion lays down with a lamb this week. Actually, yesterday, my puppy and my cat, who is not nice, had a little Eskimo kiss moment. So it's like the lion and the lamb. I'm just saying. I'm giving God praise for that. Our scripture passage today comes to us from Luke, 
and it is right after the words that we heard last week, so I'm sorry, but God has us hearing about money and stuff again, but it's important to God, so it must be important in our own lives as well. This is Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Hear now the word of the Lord. Do you know what the first words are? You should. Thank you. Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that he may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So also, you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your word is truth, it is grace, and it is sometimes really hard to hear and even harder to live in our lives. But when we hear the words, do not be afraid, Lord, etch those on our hearts and our minds, on our spirits, so that we might have the courage to do your will in this world. Amen. You know, Luke is kind of harsh on us. Sell all your possessions. Give everything away. We talked about money last week, and I told you I don't like talking about money. And I'm just going to say that some of it doesn't really sit quite well because it says don't have purses that will wear out. And all of our purses are pretty good. I have plenty at home if one wears out. But he also says to give away my possessions, and I have a very favorite Kate Spade purse that I'm just going to be honest, I'm not really willing to part with. And do you be honest, I know you have a favorite spatula, don't you? Because I do. It was my grandmother's. Are you going to give it away? It's hard to give away things that mean something to us. And Luke is constantly telling us that that's the way we're supposed to live. And then in Acts, we're continually told these type things. Sounds a little bit like socialism. And maybe Bernie Sanders should be up here instead of me. And so Jesus says, don't be afraid. Because it is terrifying. Don't be afraid. In other words, he says to you and me, I got your six, I got your back. Everything's taken care of. You don't have to worry. Your place in heaven is secure. It's taken care of. The one thing in your life that you should be most worried about, salvation, I got that. Then he says, get to work. And he gives us this to-do list. And if you were to look at my to-do list like the kids did, I can guarantee that my to-do list does not match up with what Jesus' to-do list is. Because Jesus has more challenging things God's list doesn't match up with mine. I have plenty of lists, though. I have a work list. I have a home list. I have a health list. I have a spiritual list. And then I have a long term. I have five notebooks of lists. I really like lists. And I can still tell you that very few of them would match up perfectly with God's because God's list includes selling everything. Nope. Giving alms. Okay, I do give offering. Dress ready for action. I'm not sure my outfit today is ready to go out and do some really good, solid work for Christ. Be generous. Okay, I try. Store heavenly treasures. I'm not even sure, to be honest, what that is besides my faith. Be ready. Okay. And finally, the odd one. Light your lamp. Anybody have any of those things on your to-do list? I'm guessing you don't. Remember what I said last week, we need to stop assuming that my nearest and dearest concerns are also Jesus' most important concerns. Jesus has a bigger thing going on 
And I'm reminded of the force of scripture, especially in economic matters. Did you know that economic and wealth and money is mentioned two to 3,000 times in scripture? We don't talk about it. Do you know how many times homosexuality is listed in scripture? Six. What do we focus more on in the pulpit and in our faith and in our traditions? 3,000 versus six. We are confused and we don't like talking about money. Because when, when we have to talk about money, we have to talk about the fact that love of money is the real evil. But you know what? That was last week's sermon. This week's sermon is different. Because money can do a lot of good in the right hands. But we're human. And often, that call of money over here is so much stronger than the call of Christ. We have to admit it. That's the truth. There's a lot of research out there. One suggests that people of higher socioeconomic status are more likely to break traffic laws, lie in negotiations, take or steal. They take valued goods from one another, cheat to increase their chances of winning. Even more shocking is the tendency for unethical paid behavior is not only in rich people, but those people that think they are rich. You see, money can do lots of things, and it's, it's a tough path to go down. And so Jesus says, give it away. Give it all away. And it's not the first time we've heard this. Don't think that it is. We hear we heard it all throughout Scripture. What happened when the rich young ruler went to Jesus and said, how can I have eternal life? What does Jesus say? Give all your possessions away. And the rich young ruler said, that's asking too much. John the Baptist he was even before Jesus, and he told his crowds, share what you have. Be generous with one another. What happened with Lazarus and the rich man? You remember that story? Lazarus it, it is, is there in heaven, and the rich man is down in hell. And on earth, the rich man failed to help Lazarus. And so now, tables are switched, and the rich man and Lazarus are in different positions. Can you imagine how the rich man felt? It is in Acts, that post-resurrection community, where they literally put everything in one pot and share everything commonly. And it sounds like socialism, but I want to tell you the difference. Because socialism, as we talk about it, and Bernie Sanders talks about it, my understanding is the government is helping the people. What Jesus is talking about isn't the government. It's about you and me. Get the government out of it. You and me helping one another, walking in that place with one another. Now, the danger is, with these type passages, we can do one thing and demonize wealth and say, if you're wealthy, that's bad, you've got to give it all away. But think about it, Jesus hung out with Joseph of Arimathea, quite wealthy man. Or we can over-sentimentalize poverty. And when we do that, we're in a dangerous spiral. Dangerous spiral, because if you've ever sat in abject poverty with somebody, there is nothing sentimental about it at all. So what do we do? Could be just as simple as don't get too attached to your stuff, Carrie, and give some to the poor, you know, the ones that don't fit, and the ones that, the shoes that have a little hole in the heel. I can handle that. But that's not the good news. That's not the message. And we need to stop recoiling in disgust every time scripture brings up that we have to get rid of our stuff or our money or do something that's out of our comfort zone. And there's a, there's a valid reason for it. There was an article a while ago about a, a televangelist who went to his TV audience and he asked for money because he needed a private jet because God told him that he should not fly commercial. So I get it. People are kind of questioning. I want to give money to the church. Carrie needs a private jet. I need a private I don't need a private jet. I promise. So it, it's hard. It's hard when we have to actually look at this stuff. Now, this is the passage of scripture that has that one little statement, your treasure, store yourself treasures in heaven, where your treasure is, that your heart will be also. And in Charlotte, I was doing a premarital counseling, like I always do before I marry a couple. And they constantly brought up finances over and over. It was obviously something that they were very concerned about. They were young. I just figured that, okay, 
they, we, we can talk about it, but I'm going to bypass the honorarium. We're, I'm not asking any money from these people because I'm pretty sure they're eating ramen noodles every night. And on our last meeting, I asked them what they were doing that weekend. Oh, we go to the football game. We go to every Panthers game, home or away. We have season tickets. And then I started adding up in my head. Wow, no wonder you don't have any money. Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. The design of the passage is brilliant because it starts with, it starts with, do not be afraid. Thank you, Susan. And we can easily take that into a, just a little snippet of scripture. And I have them in my house, and we have some in the church. And you probably have some in your house, reclaimed wood or, or an old palette that has been painted. And you put your favorite scripture on it, such as, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That one's in my house. Fear not would be a good one. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. All of these things are good, and they're powerful but it also defines our life if we think that we can boil down our faith to just a few words of a scripture passage we painted on a piece of wood. You can't just hang a sign. You can't just go to church. You can't just give away your clothes that are too small. You've got to live into these passages rather than allowing yourself to form those passages to fit your daily life, because that's what we like to do with scripture. We have to live into the authenticity of these instead of forcing those scriptures to meet our needs. And the best way to do that is fear not. Do you know how many times it says fear not in the Bible? This is, this is a little trivia that I learned this week that I love. Yes? Nope. It is over 300. She's Googling it as we do it, aren't we? It's over 300. 365. That gets the winner. 365. It says, do not be afraid. Is there any other thing that has 365 in it? A year. Every day, Jesus says, when you put your feet on the ground, do not be afraid. And are we listening? Because Jesus is telling us, do not be afraid. And then he says, your salvation is taken care of. I got your six. You're good. Everything's taken care of. And then we are good, right? I can do whatever I want. I got my heavenly kingdom. I don't have to be afraid. Well, who wants to go to the Valley Pine after church? Let's head out. Jesus knows that we are human, and he knows that right after you get that rock-solid promise, then we're going to get a little lazy. And then we're going to get a little... Uh, smug and uppity. We're going to have this cool attitude towards life. I've got it. I'm just going to be over here and stand cool. And that is why Jesus says, do not be afraid. We have to recognize the fear not. Think of all the decisions in your life that you made based on fear, whether you were afraid to do it or afraid not to do it. Okay? Think of it. Leaving a spouse skydiving, a first date, moving from one place to another, new jobs, going to the doctor. Fear runs our world. And we are Presbyterians. There's your little Presbyterian thought for the day, which is a wonderful tradition because we take this passage and we say, you are taken care of. You, God's got you. God's got you. You're done. Not up to you. It's up to God. If you are sitting in church, if you are a believer, then God's got you. Now, why bother with the rest of the stuff? Because as Presbyterians, we are called to service and salvation, which means that we, in response to the gift of grace, we can't help but go out and serve. In response to that promise of salvation, we can't help but live into the kingdom here and now today. But we do have a world that runs on fear. We fear everything. We fear what we can see and what we can't see. Our imagination goes wild as we talk about communities and nations. I read an article on how conspiracy theories, and I know some of them are absolutely crazy, but the reason people have them is so that they can have some sort of truth some facts to put to something they don't understand because they are afraid of misunderstanding. So you come up with a conspiracy theory 
We are fearful people. We fear losing control in our lives. We fear getting hurt. We fear being vulnerable. We fear shame and embarrassment. And you fear public speaking, and I've given you an option to overcome that fear. Be a liturgist. How do we overcome those fears that are very real in our world? We can try to escape that fear by ignoring it and that God-shaped hole in our heart that we're trying to fill with possessions and stuff and things by overeating or medication because I don't want to deal with it. Don't get me wrong, medication is good. I'm not saying it's not. But when we use anything out of fear, we are failing to trust the words of God when he says, fear not. The kingdom. And I read, it was actually on Facebook this morning, I was looking through and it's a great little article. It says um, what Jesus would be disappointed in if he came back today. And it was ten things and no power. One of them fits perfectly into the sermon. It says something to the extent of, his people are more worried about the heaven beyond than the kingdom right here. We have built an entire religion, entire faith, everything about the world eternal instead of living right here where Jesus walked and talked and lived and breathed and told us what to do. Fear not. And then we hear this wonderful quote from the German philosopher, Heinrich Hein. You ready? It's about us. God likes to forgive. True. I like to sin, he says. Really, the world is admirably arranged. And it's probably funny, you know? And it, not off key, because the Apostle Paul says later, shall we sin in order that grace may abound? Okay, well, logically, grace is good. I want all the grace I can get. And if by sinning, I can get more grace, well, that's great. I'm gonna just going to keep on this, so I can get, keep more of this. That is not who we are as God's people. And diving in a little deeper, it is not who we are as Presbyterians. It is not on God's to-do list to sin in order that we might get more grace. That's not it. We're so worried about Judgment Day that we're forgetting that Jesus told us to make this the kingdom in our midst, right here and now. The kingdom is here. It, it always amazes me how, how the first disciples could not follow Jesus' actions, words after he died, and that Jesus expects us to this many years later, when those that touched him and, and fed, ate with him and walked with him, and, all, and he expects us 2,000 years later? Doesn't seem quite fair. But the problem is, is that when we talk about that second coming, in that comes a waiting period, or so our mind thinks. We're waiting. And it, it kind of, the scripture passage suggests that as well, waiting for the, the, the host to come home, waiting. And waiting is boring, and I don't like to wait. It is frustrating. It makes me angry. I get anxiety. I don't want to wait. It seems like an impossible task, but that is not what we are being told to do. You are not being told to wait, sit in your spot till Jesus comes back, we are told to light our lamp in a very dark world, dressed for action, go and do. And it seems impossible. But when you look around the kingdom that is here and now that God is calling to you to, when you look into the eyes of those who feel like they have been forgotten and tossed out, you'll see a little bit of the kingdom. When you walk with somebody whose heart is grieving at its very worst, you become part of the kingdom today. When you find someone who can't fathom that God can love them as they are, as a sinner, broken, and you speak to them about faith and good news, you have seen the kingdom in your midst. That's what we're called to do. Be ready. Have your lamp lit. I know it sounds silly, lamp lit. But all over scripture, we've got darkness and light. And if you have your little lamp lit and you are dressed and ready to go out without fear of anything to spread the good news and, and share God's good news <coughs> with others, that's what you're called to do. 
And the beauty of it is, is when you do that, all of a sudden you begin to claim your identity as a child of God. You begin to participate in the kingdom that is coming right here and right now. Just a tiny lamp in a very dark world. That's what we're called to be. The final audit is it's going to come. We're going to stand at the judgment day. But Jesus is saying in this passage and all throughout, it's the here and the now. Do not be afraid. I got you. Now go out there and follow my to-do list. Make, you guys need to make three to-do list items. Do them tomorrow. Not yours, but something God might want. God's got the rest. And out of grace, we get to serve without fear. All glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. At this time, I'm going to, if you're watching online, we'll ask you to get your communion so that you can join us for communion. I'll ask Jake, would you go get the kids to return so they can have communion with their families? Um, and I'll have, I think Ruth is serving with me. Um, we will have communion um, at my invitation with the little cups. If you don't feel comfortable coming forward, please know that there's a tray in the back with the little sterilized cups. My friends, this is the table of Christ. It is Christ our Savior that is host. It is not me. It is not Ruth. It is not this church, it is not the PCUSA, it is Christ alone who is host. And he invites each and every one of you to this table to experience grace in its purest and simplest form. But before we break bread and break this cup, first let's go to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, your truth is beyond words. It, your good news is earth shattering. And yet we try to just put it down into one pithy statement. Broaden in our hearts and our minds. Remind us not to be afraid and to take on the courage that your son Jesus Christ took when he walked upon this earth. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as a church. May we not just be a place of worship, but might we be a place of welcome and hospitality and a place of doers and beers in this world so that we can be the kingdom for those people that are forgotten, that are lost, that are grieving, that are hungry, that are homeless. Let us, Lord, bring about the kingdom and will you beg, we beg of you to show us the way. And as your church, as we join in worship, we also join in fellowship and we celebrate all sorts of wonderful, beautiful things within this world. We celebrate the healing of Blake and his shoulder. We celebrate Khaleesi turning nine years old. We pray for many, 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 many more birthdays to come. We pray and give thanks, Lord, for animals go on. We give thanks, Lord, for family. We ask in your mercy, Lord, to be with Marsha. We ask you in your mercy to be with Deanna, Althea, Tracy, and David. We praise you, Lord, for the seven years of being clean from our disease, the courage that that takes, and the amount of strength, Lord, we know it came from you. So now, Lord, as we gather around this table, we share this bread and this cup. Remind us that we are one family, joined together through your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of the daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but let deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup. 
And he said, this is my blood shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the blood of the new covenant. Take and drink. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God.
We are fed by the bodies around us, the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, the food that strengthen us, strengthens us for our journey ahead. Help us to have no fear and follow your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 2241 in the thin blue hymn. Go and serve. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.